Hello, everybody. I am Ravi Brambat, uh, a doctoral student at University of Houston, Clear Lake. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of having a conversation with Dr. Paul Wagner today on the personality of mathematics book. Uh, Dr. Wagner serves as a full-time professor of philosophy and logic with the College of Human Sciences and Humanities and uh, area coordinator for statistics, research, and educational psychology with the College of Education at the University of Houston Clear Lake. Uh, he is also a former vice president of Association of Philosophers in Education and former executive secretary of the Philosophy of Education Society. Um, he has uh, a dozen articles in math and math uh, education in professional journals and in addition to being the lead author of the Personality of Mathematics book. Dr. Wagner, thank you so much for your time. I'm excited to, for our conversation. Look forward to it. So Dr. Wagner, just let's get right into it. This book is full of technical episodes and the development of mathematics, but it also has um, much practical learning recommendations for making math accessible to all. Uh, I really uh, admire that. So which do you want to start with? Well, that's certainly a great question. Um, the, uh, the book does have a lot of technical mathematics in it. And um, so from the time of um, uh, Zeno's paradoxes to the work of uh, uh, George Cantor and Infinity and David Hilbert and Emmy Noether and so on, the technical mathematics doesn't carry over well when we're doing a, um, uh, a video discussion of, of this sort of thing. Uh, so uh, I think we're gonna go largely with the aspects of the book that will be relevant to those who are most likely to be responsible for teaching mathematics. So think of the book as really a, a, a kind of a, a double book. On the one hand, it's a great popular book in the history of mathematics. And on the other hand, it has a, an abundance of recommendations for teachers who um, at every level who are responsible for bringing students into the world of mathematics rather than just teaching them how to get ready for uh, the next standardized multiple choice question that may have to deal with um, adding, subtracting the Pythagorean theorem or whatever. So let me ask a follow-up question there. Does academic disciplines have a personality? Um, very much think so. And there, I think there's two reasons for it. Uh, imagine who you have selected as friends in your life, both boyfriends and girlfriends and so on. And there's probably some commonalities that these other people have that draw your attention to them and that draw their attention to you. Well, the same is true of the disciplines that we find ourselves interested in. We find ourselves interested in uh, mathematics because there's something in us and something in mathematics that draws our attention somebody else may find just the same sort of attraction to history or to psychology. And um, so that seems to testify to the idea that humans respond to different subject matters as though they have uh, a personality. And when we do so, it's as though we help create the personality in that discipline in addition to whatever personality the discipline may have on its own. What do you mean by, uh, to, are, by suggesting math has a personality? You bet. Um, mathematics, when I think of the personality of mathematics, the first word that comes to my mind is courage. Um, to be a mathematician, I mean, to really be a mathematician, not just somebody who's adding up some schoolwork for a class, but to really be a mathematician, you've got to have the courage to look at a problem that nobody else has been able to solve yet. In fact, most people never even imagined it. And you're going to keep on giving up days and weeks and months and maybe even a lifetime to try to solve a handful or maybe even a single problem. That takes a lot of courage. It also takes a lot of self-discipline. It takes an extraordinary amount of curiosity. I like to think of mathematics, particularly pure mathematics, as something like a wilderness 
that nobody has traveled through before. And so the mathematician, the really true, the true uh, pure mathematician is willing to wander into that wilderness on his own. Competent people in mathematics will try to follow those paths and then they're gonna to wanna to find their way back out. But the truly heroic mathematician wants to keep on exploring that wilderness of mathematics. So when I think of the personality of mathematics, that's what comes to mind. Wow. Uh, what are some features uh, of the personality of mathematics? Maybe. Well, we, yeah, we already mentioned a few of those just now. Yeah, some more. Those features too uh, is that uh, who who does um, that 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 personality of mathematics uh, uh, attract? I, I think for people that have been watching uh, um, Young Sheldon on TV for the past few years, uh, they might think to themselves, "Well, uh, high pollutant physics and mathematics are all left to." strange human beings that think on a level and in a world different from all the rest of us. Now, there is a lot to that, but mathematicians also fall in romantic love, such as the great Fermat did. Um, and one of the reasons we never found the proof that he uh, claimed to have to his conjecture is because uh, before he could write it out, he got in a duel over a lady love and, um, and he lost. And so we, we lost whatever that, that, that proof was going to be. Johnny von Neumann, who uh, a great mathematician, one of the founders of um, all of artificial intelligence, uh, von Neumann in the 20th century was said to be able to calculate faster than a lot of the computer machines he designed. He was just amazing. But he had this extraordinary sense of humor and people just loved to be at his parties. Alfred Tarski at Berkeley, a uh, logician and mathematician who defined for us uh, truth in mathematical terms. Uh, he was known for having these parties that would go into the wee hours of the morning and sometimes had some, um, it was rumored had some drugs that kept people going that long. Um, but he was just fascinated with um, having a good time. That's a mathematician. Cool. So, so you talk about categories of people who learn to do math uh, to varying degrees. For example, you talk about uh, merely competent uh, in, in math. Uh, how are they identified? Well, we uh, most of us, when we are going to um, high school and then perhaps college or whatever, we know that a lot of our uh, friends who go into fields like engineering uh, and maybe advanced work in economics or finance, uh, they're, they're pretty good at running the numbers, to use the phrase that's common then. And um, that, that means being very competent in mathematics. You, uh, you can use what's already known. Being competent in mathematics is different than being, say, very good at mathematics. An accountant is very good at mathematics, but they're not um, uh, exceptionally uh, uh, skilled at it. And then the heroes of mathematics, the champions of mathematics, they're the ones that want to go where nobody else has ever gone before and for no other reason than that they want to be there because no one else has been there. Uh, a great example of that is there was a mathematician by the name of Leonard Euler, it's pronounced Euler, uh, but when you see it in the, uh, in the books, it's E-U-L-E-R. Uh, he came up with the concept of imaginary numbers. And so the square root, for example, of negative two, um, what might that be? Um, and uh, we have found that not only is our imaginary numbers an area of intriguing interest, but we've been able to use them to do all sorts of things in, in uh, electrodynamics and in quantum physics. Uh, turned out to be really useful numbers, even though they still carry that kind of funny adjective with them imaginary numbers. So in that answer, you talked about uh, you know, good, very good heroes. Uh, so, so let's take it uh, one at a time. How are people good at math identified? I think people that are identified as good at mathematics uh, are identified by 
many of the standardized tests that we have available right now. You give somebody a problem and you see if they can, um, you know, get an answer to it. And if they can recognize an answer to it out of a handful of alternatives, you say, well, that's pretty good because most people can't do that. People who are very good at mathematics can show us their work, right? So we say, you know, here's a problem. I want you to, to prove the solution and show your work. So that's people who are very good at mathematics. Uh, you might imagine somebody who is, say, good at mathematics and are asked a question on a test. Uh, you've got a right triangle. Uh, one side, A, is equal to three. Uh, another side of the right angle is um, B, and that's equal to four. What's the hypotenuse of the triangle? And so the person who's good at mathematics has gotten used to going three squared plus four squared is going to give me 25. And um, so that means the hypotenuse is going to be the square root of 25. And so an almost robotic-like fashion, like learning short order drill as a soldier in the military, they can get those answers and they can do that right. Uh, somebody who is very good at mathematics is able to take, say, the Pythagorean theorem and uh, use it to study whether or not plane geometry, such as Euclid was actually working on, uh, whether or not plane geometry is sufficient to tell us about how the world really is. Or is it the case that as certain very competent mathematicians, uh, applied mathematicians like Lobachevsky, Carl Gauss, and um, Bernard Riemann uh, were able to take Euclid's work and saying, you know, when you look at physics, the world seems to be full of curved space. So much so that even any two points anywhere in space, no matter how close they are, not only is there an infinitesimal amount of divisions that can be made in that distance, you can divide that tiny distance an infinitesimal amount of time, no matter how close those points are. But even more so, the distance between the two points, no matter how close they seem to be, constitutes something we call a geodesic. That is to say, a curved line, not a straight line. Einstein was able to take that and, and it's foundational to general relativity theory. In general relativity theory, there's no such thing in the real world as a straight line. All lines are curved by the matter in the universe and the shape of the space. All lines are geodistics. The so-called straight line is only a fiction that exists in high school textbooks. Uh, so, so uh, how how are heroes of math identified? Uh, can you give us some example? Oh yeah, they 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 think about things that none of the rest of us would ever imagine thinking about. Uh, what, what one of my favorite examples is uh, there was a mathematician by the name of David Hilbert, and back at the beginning of the 20th century, he was very famous. Uh, uh, as one of the founders of uh, physics at the time and also of number theory. And he started thinking about infinity. So he says, uh, the set of natural numbers, accounting numbers, how big is that set? Well, we say, well, that's infinite. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can always add one more, can't you? So Hilbert comes along and says, well, what about this? How big is the set of odd natural numbers? One, three, five, seven. Can't you always add two? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. So, for Hilbert, there's a guy called George Cantor that said, All right, are these two sets, are these two infinite numbers different or the same size? And Cantor's conclusion was that they're the same size, but there's something troubling about this because. If you take a number line and you, and you write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven across the top, and then underneath it, you write the odd natural numbers, one, three, five, seven, you can see that there's a gap on the odd natural numbers, which doesn't exist on the natural numbers. And so Cantor is able to point out that 
the set of natural numbers, while it's infinite, so that means it's the same size as a set of natural, odd natural numbers, but it can swallow up the entire set of odd natural numbers. So the sets somehow name different infinities, even though they both have the same size. Oh, how do we figure this out? How, how do we push this further? So we've got David Hilbert coming along to give us this great little example. He says, there's this hotel and the hotel has an infinite number of rooms. Okay, I understand that. I got a hotel and it's got an infinite number of rooms. And then he says, and they're all filled. Okay, I can understand that. So we've got this really big hotel, really, really big because it's infinite, infinite, and it's all filled. You know, somebody comes to the front desk and says, I'd like a room. Well, what do you do? And Hilbert says, it's very easy. You just send the bellhop to the first room and you tell the people there they have to come on out and move into the second room. Bellhop goes to the second room and tells the people they have to come on out and move to the third room. And you just do that all the way down the line. And so the new guest comes in and moves into the first room. Everyone's happy. Everyone's got a room. There's no problem. To make the whole thing even that much more spectacular, imagine a second guest comes along. What do you do? And Hilbert says, you do the same thing. In fact, Hilbert points out, you could have an infinite number of new guests come. And you would do the same thing over and over again. And the infinite hotel will accommodate every one of them and every one of the infinite guests already there and all those coming in will have a place to stay. How does an ordinary human brain work that way? But that's the kind of imagination you find in the heroes of mathematics. They really are Olympians, unlike so many of the rest of us. You think of an athlete like Muhammad Ali in boxing. I mean, how many Muhammad Ali's were there? How many David Hilberts were there in the study of mathematics? These are Olympians. Great example, wow. So uh, can you define the word indoctrination uh, for us uh, since it plays an important role in the early chapters? Yeah. Early on, you know, if, in fact, let, let's go back way back in evolution. We just came out of the uh, African savanna and we were living in small tribes. Children learn things by having adults say here, see what I do, do this as I do it. I mean, that's pretty much the alpha and the omega of education back in those days when we were, you know, coming out of the, uh, the forest, uh, differentiating our, ourselves from our, our primate cousins. Now, over time, there's always been a role for indoctrination. What is indoctrination? Indoctrination is causing someone to have a belief for which they are unable to provide a justification. Probably everyone listening to our little uh, exchange here uh, has learned the, um, uh, who's a, an English speaker, has learned what's called the alphabet song. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, K, okay. So we all learn that alphabet song no matter where we were born and raised in the uh, English speaking world and so on. And there is no particular reason why um, NOP have to be organized in that order, NOP, why couldn't it be ONP? It could be anything, but we've chosen it not to be that way. And rather than just leave everything to be arbitrary, we've got to, if we're gonna help kids ever read and understand language, we've got to give them the tools of an alphabet so they can start recognizing words, reading them, writing them and so on. We make up this clever little song and we don't let them ask any questions about why is the order as it is. We just get them to do it. See this, hear it, do it as I do it. And at the early stages in education and in virtually anything, we have to start off with a bit of um, indoctrination. When you have a young medical student um, beginning you know, his professional work, He's just told this is the way certain things are done initially. 
And as they proceed and go on to a residency and so on, they see more variability and they get to do something with what they've learned. But everybody, as they first enter into a new discipline, simply has to be indoctrinated. That is, they have to get some tools that they have learned how to employ, but they don't have any justification available at this point to learn how to employ them. They just have to see, this is how I do it. Now you do it like this. They've got to get to that point before their education can continue. That's indoctrination. And um, indoctrination has picked up um, you know, a bad name ever since uh, the, the Nazis, if not before that. Um, but you look back at the 19th century and indoctrination, and a lot of religious texts was written as, you know, that's what you're supposed to do to help people get a grip on their religion. Um, it's because of the connotation of the word indoctrination as we move into the mid 20th century that the concept wound up picking up uh, a, a, a bad association. Indoctrination makes perfectly good sense whenever anybody is beginning to learn something new. I had a ranch one time, not terribly far from uh, the city where I live, and um, I, I grew up in Chicago, so I knew nothing about ranch. I had a couple of neighbors, one who never got past sixth grade. I went to those guys a lot to ask them how to do things because I did not know how to do things on my ranch that they knew how to do. So they would tell me, I would watch them, and then I would try to do it just like they did. After getting the hang of it for a few years, I might have been somewhat inventive on some of these things on my own. But initially, I had to watch them, hear what they had to say, and do it as they did it. And then I would eventually get to a point where I could manage affairs a little bit more uh, masterfully on my own. So one thing I would like to add about indoctrination, I see it as a necessary or a dangerous good. You can't do without it at the front end. But if you overdo indoctrination, then you begin crushing the spirit of the student. And that's dangerous and that's bad. So indoctrination is a dangerous good. It's, it's kind of like medicine. There's, uh, you, you take a medicine for you know, a certain ailment you have, but if you take too much of it, you can make the situation worse. Indoctrination has a role and it's limited. Too much of it is poisonous. So, so why do you think indoctrination is unavoidable in the early stages of mathematical learning? You know, because we have this arbitrary language that we use, um, you know, uh, Roman numerals, for example, is one way to count things off, right? And the um, Arabic alphabet that, that we use now throughout uh, the, uh, probably the probably most of the world, um, except for very small sectors that um, aren't a part of the industrialized world. Um, and, and, and so we use uh, Arabic numbers as a matter of convention. And so five comes after four, but before six, not because it has to, but we've got to have some kind of uh, agreed upon system that, that we work on. We can also take our, our Arabic numbers and we can reduce all of them, as we sometimes do, to binary notation to help our machines think as well as we think about matters of mathematics. And, and lo and behold, with their binary mathematics, before you know it, they're able to calculate uh, much more efficiently than we are using our Arabic uh, numbers. All right, let's switch gears. That, that's really insightful. So, so perhaps the most important concept in the book uh, is the concept of a threshold, uh, of threshold. Can you tell us what the term means and why it's so important? Oh, that's, that is that's such an important word. Uh, I've, I've used it in several other articles dealing with science um, and in mathematics. Uh, thresholds are where indoctrination must stop for now. 
because the students got a handle on what they need to have a handle on to begin doing the work on their own. Using my example before about out at the ranch, after the neighbors taught me how to do certain sorts of things, then I was able to do them on my own, mimicking what I had been taught. But of course, my ranch was a little bit different size, different terrain, and there would be reasons for doing adjustments to how my neighbors did certain things. But once I understood the things that they had indoctrinated me in and that I just mimicked for a while, eventually I saw that there were ways I could begin changing some things to get things done a little bit better. So once I had really grasped what my neighbors were trying to get me to understand about clearing out a forest or doing this for them, then I was at a threshold where if I continued to act robotically the way they had taught me, I would not have been very skilled at cleaning up my own ranch. But with those skills in mind, then I was able to proceed and be more inventive as I passed through the threshold and started doing things differently. Now, sooner or later, I, I see life as becoming full of thresholds. Um, think of this, a simple example that we can all go through. Um, and boys and girls oftentimes didn't want to have much to do with each other when they were little kids. And somewhere in prepubescent years, um, they want to you know, affiliate with one another, and, but they don't know how to do it. And, and so they learn from older brothers or sisters or television or something like that. And they mimic what they've seen older people do. Now, one of the things that's gonna to have to happen is that they're gonna to have to develop their own style. They can't just keep mimicking what somebody else is doing and have everything turn out just as wonderfully as it does on Nickelodeon or the Disney Channel or whatever it might be. And so, once they've gotten to that point where they have in hand what they have mimicked, they realize I've got to go beyond just mimicking what I've learned to this point. I'm at a threshold. And so now I have to start doing things a little bit more independently, employing what I've acquired so far, but mastering it so that I can adjust it to fit better the circumstances I am addressing and, and my nature, which is going to play a role in all of that as well. And so um, we find that same thing going on throughout our sciences. We, we acquire certain knowledge that takes us up to a certain point. Standardized tests, one of the problems with them is they never take a student beyond what's good enough. All that happens is you bring the student up to what's good enough to get the answers to this test, but you haven't led them through a threshold. The student goes through a threshold when they start asking questions about what they think they've learned. Students have gone through the threshold when they're able to start giving an account of why what they've just learned seems to make sense. So can teachers be doing a moral uh, wrong by access indoctrination and failure to recognize when students, you know, understand has crossed the threshold? That's a super question. And I think you're absolutely right. If the teacher has only one method of teaching and that is to indoctrinate, I mean, whatever little details they may put in there, if what they're doing when all the smoke clears away is just indoctrinating the kid, here, do this, see what I do, do this as I do it, now you do it this way. If that's all you do to the student over and over again, he never gets to move through a threshold and begin to become an adventurer in a discipline on his own. And rather than advancing, there's, a, there's this wonderful word that uh, the philosopher Kant came up with called autonomy, uh, the ability to override a bad decision, uh, the ability to employ uh, a good reason for advancing an argument. If all you've done is indoctrinated students, they never get a chance to develop autonomy 
so they can never become creative. They can never become builders within any discipline. So once uh, the role of indoctrination has been completed up to a certain point, now the threshold has to be presented and nurtured. And the student, as they move through that, develop their own autonomy to move forward until they get to the next stage in which a bunch of new stuff that they've never seen before has to be learned. See this, do this as I do this. So there will be another period of, of indoctrination at a higher level, but it's only justified if it gets the student to one more level of threshold beyond which they become, again, a new adventurer at a much higher level. I, I like that a lot. Um, so, so, so you talk about math, uh, you know, as an adventure, as a wilderness uh, explored by, you know, those good in math and and um, and those uh, who love lifetime love for like the heroes of math. Mm -hmm. So, what do you mean when you talk about math as an exploring a wilderness, uh, or how can uh, education leads students into this uncharted areas of maths, adventurous wilderness. So one of the things that's kind of interesting about that is when you think about it, none of us has ever experienced math. We've never experienced it. The scientists can tell us that um, all mammals um, have a what's called a number sense. Uh, at least all, all mammals seem to have a number sense in primitive peoples today and millennia past have had a number sense. We can recognize something about the quantitative element of life. Uh, the the, the, the uh, cheetah or a jaguar that's chasing down a bit of game um, makes a calculation about whether or not continuing this hunt in this heat, given that the prey has such an advance and seems to be so fast ahead of them, the a predatory animal has to decide, is the chase worth continuing or am I expanding too many calories and I best give up this chase and look for a weaker prey a little bit later. The fact that that happens among different animals is evidence of a number sense. You know, we're doing a kind of calculation and, and, and computers, of course, can, can model that kind of calculation too baseball player hits a ball out in the right field and that right fielder has to adjust his speed and the angle at which he runs to be able to go and be under that ball when it comes down. He is not running any equations in his head. Though a computer could run equations and tell you exactly where it's gonna land. But the human being, just like the animal, the cheetah or the jaguar or whatever, is using what we call number sense. It seems to be evolutionarily built into our brains that allows us to make those kinds of interesting approximations. But we humans have gone way beyond that because we talk in terms of not only numbers standing for things, representing things uh, and individuating some things from others. Uh, we can keep a, a counting books, which is how we did a lot of our math initially. We were just trying to keep track of how many sheep did we sell to somebody else to get so many goats, whatever it might have been. But we started noticing there seemed to be rules and laws buried inside mathematics. And it wasn't just a tool anymore. It was something that was almost living by itself. So you get the ancient Greeks, for example, who um, with Zeno get becomes concerned about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the paradox. He, he, he talks about Achilles, the great athlete, in a race with the, um, uh, the turtle. And a turtle gets a 10-yard head start. Bang, the gun, oh, the gun goes off. Bang, the gun goes off. And the turtle starts marching along toward the finish line. And the great Achilles comes racing along. Now, doesn't he have to go? Doesn't that, doesn't Achilles have to go half the distance in the first second to be able to get to where the, uh, the turtle is. Well, yeah, and the turtle had to go half that distance to get to where he is, right? Yeah, yeah, let another couple of seconds pass. Didn't the 
Achilles have to, didn't Achilles have to go half the distance again? And Zeno says, you know, if Achilles has to go an infinite, has to go half the distance, and you separate that over an infinite amount of time, he can never catch the turtle because he'll always have to go half the distance to wherever the turtle was. But the turtle's going to be one or two steps beyond that now. And so as a feat of logic, Zeno says, so therefore, Achilles can never catch the tortoise. And we go, well, that's crazy talk because we, we know tortoises are so slow and we can run up and catch them. And so, you know, said, well, that may be, but you tell me, you tell me how your experience defies the logic of my paradox. And we go, oh, goodness, how did that, how did that happen? It looks like there are these things going on inside mathematics that we never expected. We never built them. We never invented them. They're already in there. In the case of um, zero, uh, the folks in India spent 500 years debating and arguing over whether or not zero was a number. And um, by the time they finally came to an agreement on it, um, people from the Mideast learned from them that zero should count as a number. And it wasn't until the 15th century, I believe, that Leonardo of Pisa, also known as Fibonacci, he had gone to the Mideast and he had learned from the Moors and the uh, Arab nations there about zero and had taken it back up to Italy, which was part of beginning the Italian Renaissance in mathematics. But that, that whole concept of zero, that was studied and debated for 500 years in India alone. You think, well, how, how, how could be so significant about zero? Zero is unlike any other number. So how do you count it as a number? If I add one plus two, I'm going to get a new number. It's going to be three. If I, even if I allow number, negative numbers in. So I have the number three and I add a negative two, I'm going to have a one left. But what happens when I add zero to a number? Well, nothing changes. Well, did you add anything or not? Well, I added, you added what? Is zero a number or not? All numbers change the number that get that they get added to. All numbers change the number that you start with if you subtract them from that number. All numbers change if you divide, if you multiply them by, by zero. And what happens with you when you divide a number by zero? Zero is just weird. Then you try to think about negative numbers and positive numbers. Well, okay, so we have one and we could have a negative one, we could have two, we could have a negative two. I, I can kind of think about this, but wait a minute, how, how, what's the seam between the positive and negative numbers? Where do they line up with one? Another? Well, there's this thing in between them that separates them. What, what do you call that? You call that zero. Well, who, who is zero with? I mean, there's an infinite number of positive numbers. There's an infinite number of negative numbers. How does zero get to be all by itself and be so important to all the other numbers? Oh my gosh, we didn't get a chance to invent that. We discovered it. The idea of discovering things in mathematics. There is a mathematician alive today uh, by the name of Gregory Perlman in New York City. He had been offered the Fields Medal for one of his uh, discoveries, which a million bucks goes with that. And he turned it down. He also had um, uh, discovered, David Hilbert came up with 10 problems, a mathematical problems that he said uh, that he got a bank to put a million dollars up for the solution to each and every one of those problems. So Perlman, first of all, he does extraordinary work and the mathematicians of the world give him the Fields Medal. He refuses to accept it, no million dollars, he turns it down. He solves one of Hilbert's problems. There's another million dollars. He turns it down. He lives in a little apartment in New York City and occasionally teaches at one of the big universities there when he needs enough money to just keep on going. He said, why would you do that? The Fields Medal is like the Nobel Prize of math. And, and Perlman says, well, you know, in physics, you, know, you, you invent things. And I've never invented anything. I, the stuff I do, it's already been there. I just happened to get there before somebody else. 
the wilderness. He was the first one in the wilderness to find us. He doesn't deserve anything, he says, because he was first there. He just stumbled upon it before somebody else did. Oh my gosh, lucky me, but I don't deserve anything for it. That's really kind of strange, but that's what we sometimes find in these people that we celebrate as the genius, the champions of mathematics. They're just so caught up in, in this thing. But a biologist is gonna look at life that we can touch and see and smell. Um, uh, physicists, uh, even when they're looking at a Higgs boson, which they say is a massless particle, that's weird, but it leaves traces. So we can find traces of it and that's real stuff. But what do you do with mathematics that seems to have these properties and no one has ever tasted or touched or observed any infinity? Infinity only becomes what it becomes because of the rules that we've recognized hold math together. And these rules seem to stay stable, even when you move from culture to culture in different numbering systems. But the rules of mathematics, they, they're like they're sacred. They don't change. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing. So, so you know, uh, I've had the... Uh, the, the honor of in, interviewing you on multiple uh, uh, topics. Uh, uh, another concept you talk about is student building. And in fact, I think you talked about it, um, student building in, in two of your previous books. Uh, first was the thinking ahead. And second was the education for knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any reflection uh, from that, uh, that you can connect, uh, oh, uh, share sure. a little bit about student building? Student building is about taking students to threshold after threshold. And if the schools can't get students through a whole sequence of thresholds that allows them to have control and mastery over significant parts of the world in which they live, then the schools have failed. It doesn't make any difference what scores the kids got on a standardized test. If you can pick out the answer to 17 as C when they're asking you a question about the Pythagorean theorem, but you can't use that theorem to lay carpet or to shingle your roof, what's been the point? If the Pythagorean theorem doesn't even lead you to just speculate about the nature of mathematics and, and, and how we human beings can be the kind of creatures that, that think about that stuff, then, then, then what's been the point? People a hundred years ago learning Euclidean geometry, one of the things they would have learned is that all triangles have 180 degrees in them. That's just it. That's the truth. We're all said and done. Now, next thing to learn. But ever since we've learned that space is curved, one of the things that's fascinating is that in curved space, no triangles have 180 degrees. They all have either more or they have less. You want to imagine this? And this is something that any kid can learn to do if a teacher will stop trying to prepare them for the next test, but instead try to bring them through a threshold and help them imagine things. Take a basketball, cut it in half. Then take your straight edge ruler and draw a line and then another line and then complete the triangle. Now that's on the outside of the um, uh, basketball. Uh, and you measure the degrees of each angle, you're gonna get all the angles that add up to over 180 degrees. Take your ruler and put it, turn that, that uh, basketball upside down. And now take your straight edge and draw another triangle. And now have the kids measure the, the, um, the angles, the degrees and the angles because now all those sides will be convex. And so all the, the, the number of degrees of the angles are gonna add up to less than 180 degrees. The only place a, an angle has 180 degrees is in this really weird and exceptional world that you find on blackboards. 
where it's all flat, hence plane geometry. It's really plain in a lot of ways, not plain P-L-A-N-E, but when you think about it, it's pretty much P-L-A-I-N as well. But um, when you look at the uh, geometry of curved space that the physicist has to deal with, oh my gosh, now all of a sudden we get these completely different rules about, about triangles and curved space and whether or not the space is concave or convex and, and what would happen if it was a mix of the two and that's going through a threshold that's entering a wilderness that's being lured into the personality of in this case the discipline of mathematics and maybe physics too um, that's what teachers are supposed to be doing for students and mathematics should be as lively as any other discipline that you can think of. I, a little aside, I can remember looking back when my first daughter went to school and um, I knew the way teachers would talk about math. They would say to the kids, all right, bring out your homework. Uh, we're gonna go over your math homework from last night. No wonder the kids didn't like it. And then by the same token, when we're looking at elementary school kids, and by the same token, the teacher might say, all right, clear your desks and we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna have art now for the next hour. The kids are all, oh, yay. The kids are going to naturally mimic what they see the adults in their world doing. Whenever I picked up my daughter from elementary school, I always asked her, um, what did you do in school today? And before I got the standard, nothing. Uh, what did you do in school today? I would say to her, did you have recesses and did you learn any new rules in the games of mathematics? And she started loving that. Now, by the time she was in fourth grade, she was going to junior high uh, to do honors math classes over there. And not because she was any kind of, she was no Sheldon. She just happened to be from a home from somebody that applauded mathematics as being a game. And whenever I talked about art, because I knew the way the teachers would talk about art, I'd always ask her, did you do any art work today? Because I also didn't want her to associate the word work with a bad four letter word. So uh, since I knew in school, art work was always going to be, yay, that'll be fun. So I would talk about art work. So work was associated with fun at school. And then I always associate math with recess. Both are full of games and all games have rules. That, that's a good advice for parents and educators as well. So, uh, so in your book, you talk about search for truth as an ideal and truth securing the highest of intellectual practices. Are there truths of math that we can grasp and, and not just approximate? Um, well, yeah, actually, that's kind of an easy question, and the answer is yes. The reason there can be truths of mathematics is Alfred Tarski, the, the great logician who uh, wound up uh, at Berkeley after being, he used to be at the, at the University of Warsaw, a lot of people don't know, early part of the 20th century, three places that were tops in the world for math were the University of Göttingen in Germany, the University of Moscow, and probably number one was the University of Warsaw in Poland. And when the Nazis took over, they, they, they slaughtered all the Jewish professors. And Tarski actually was on his way to the meeting that was called for them to show up. He was just getting there late and um, saw the, uh, the, the trucks of the stormtroopers pull up after the professors had gone into the auditorium. And uh, being Jewish, he you know <laughs> knew himself he shouldn't go in. And he saw what they did. And so then he escaped, got to this country, went to Berkeley. Um, and Berkeley had a department of philosophy and a department of math. But because of uh, Tarski, they built a third department, a department of logic, which brought philosophers and mathematicians together. And yeah, in math, we can, in logic and math, we can have real truths because they are not about the world. As soon as you apply math to the world, then you've got something else going on. But when you're just looking at the 
let's say the truths of math itself, they exist because the rules oblige them to exist. Not the world, but the rules oblige them to exist. Two plus two equals four, not because of anything in the world, but just because that's the way we play that game. If math were about things in the world, imagine this. You took a, uh, an eyedropper and you took a, an eyedropper of quicksilver, mercury, and you put it on a table. And then you took another drop of quicksilver and you put it right next to that drop but so they could just barely touch each other. What would happen? Well, the mass of, uh, of mercury quicksilver is it's so heavy, it quickly would go together and become one drop. So if math was about the world, we'd have rules like one plus one equals one. But we don't have rules like that. Uh, in math, one plus one equals two. But not because anything in the world is like that, but because that's the way math is organized. And we use math to organize our thinking about the world because it's such a powerful and rigorous language. But not because the world has told us we have to be organized. We, the world, have to be organized mathematically. So, so we use probability to help us do statistics and in, in the sciences, and, and thereby it helps us approximate like the ideal. Right. But are there actual truths in math that, that we can grasp? Sure. Uh, given what a two is, when you add a two plus a two, you get a four. That's a truth of mathematics. It's not a truth of the world. It's a truth of mathematics. I, I can show you my fingers. There's two fingers. And my fingers, uh, hairiness and nailness, wrinkledness, those are all properties of my fingers. But you put two fingers and two fingers together, and um, uh, you, we say that that's four fingers, but you don't find fourness, you don't find two-ness in my fingers. You're ready for this one. The only place you find two-ness is in the C-ness. That's a little joke. You don't find two-ness as a property of my fingers. Hairiness, wrinkledness, nailness, whiteness are a property of my fingers, but two-ness is it. But we use the mathematical language of two plus two equals four to arrange a rigorous way of talking about a piece of the world. Imaginary numbers of, of Euler. I mean, <laughs> there's. Uh, it's very useful to talk about uh, the square root of negative two, but there is no way we've ever seen such a thing in the world. Um, we also have, let's, let's take something like uh, uh, a, a great question for kids, Pythagorean theorem. You, know, you want to bring them through a threshold? Ask them this one. What if A, side A, on a right angle is equal to one, side B is equal to one, so what's the square root of um, side A? Well, it's one times one, so that's one. Okay, well, what's the square, what's the square of uh, side B? You said that was one also. So one times one, that's one also, okay. So now what's the hypotenuse? Well, you're gonna add the one together with the one, and so the hypotenuse is the square root of two. Well, what's that? Not a negative two, it's not an order number. Um, the square root of two. Well, that's an irrational number. Oh my gosh, we've got imaginary. Now you've got real numbers, you've got unreal numbers, and, and, and now you got irrational numbers. Uh huh, yeah, you do. And um, so the square root of two is 1.41 on infinitely. We can't find it on the number line. And that's the truth of mathematics. Nice. So uh, in speaking of truth, uh, you have key ideas at the end of each chapter uh, in this book. Uh, yeah. They look like they could be helpful to all teachers and not just math educators. Uh, oh, yeah. Is that the truth? <laughs> that's the truth, yeah. I, I could even, um, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I could even even read uh, a few of these uh, just to uh, just to give you a sample of what the uh, key ideas are. One is thresholds. Thresholds are demonstrable markers indicating student passage beyond basic, 
fundamentals at one level to realized opportunities for inquiry at more advanced le uh, levels. Or how about this one? Learning to do mathematics is what makes, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, learning to do mathematics is more than increased calculation skills. Doubting, boy, mathematicians doubt all the time. You know, somebody claims to have a proof of something, his buddies are all there trying to look to see whether or not that proof will hold up. So here's a great one-liner for life as well as for math. Doubting is what rescues people from intellectual complacency. Rescue from intellectual complacency is critical in the advance of mathematical understanding. That doesn't hurt us in life either. And there are so many others that you know that I that I could um, go in through here. Yeah, I'll give I'll give you just one more set of it. The personality of mathematics in alignment of human personality with mathematics has um, five features. And, and I'll just read the five features to you quickly. One of them, love. Love applauds mystery. And math reveals mystery and affection to those who learn to love it. Another one, beauty. It's part of personality. Beauty is revealed in a taxonomic range of number types and in concert emerging functions and operations. Another one, wait, what? Experiencing the personality of mathematics involves an experiential feel for investigation into the unique mathematical wilderness. Next, there is more to mathematical understanding than being good at it or even being very good at it. And lastly, the fifth feature of mathematical personality seems most apparent. Mathematics could never be built out of the material of human sensory observation alone. Obviously, if it could, other animals would have built mathematics as well. No other animal has gotten beyond a number sense. Great point. Uh, so I know you hinted to time uh, in your last uh, response there. So I'm going to be mindful of time here. But but thank you for your time once again. Uh, given how lofty thinking becomes when we talk about math, uh, especially pure math, uh, I've heard uh, it. It said from uh, Indian scholars that math opens, you know, something of a divine, right? Plato uh, in ancient Greek uh, thought math. Uh, Truth was was exacting, and the pure of the greatest log logician of the last century, uh, Kurt Goldil, worked on the proof that God exists. So here's my last question: Could math be the language of a creator more intelligent than humans? Well, certainly, no one's in a position to disprove that. So we can start with that. <laughs> no one's in a position to disprove that. Beyond that. One of the things that um, we can say, uh, the atheist physicist, um, Stephen Hawking said, let's look at the physics of the world and reverse engineer all the mathematics all the way back to the Big Bang, all the way back to the split nanosecond of the Big Bang. And he tells us that all the information in the entire world would be preserved in that moment. Nick Lane, a very famous biochemist who just came out with a brand new book called Transformations. He tells us that all the information of life is wrapped up in information, not, not, not in the material substances, but in information itself. And Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, he doesn't associate information with any stuff in the world. It's just the arrangement of 
symbols and they don't have to have a place where they're arranged. So go back to Hawking and you re, you've taken all the information that's created about everything in the universe and our bodies and all the different galaxies, all the things the Webb telescope is showing us, all of that reduces back to what Hawking would call the singularity. And it's a mathematical singularity. A mathematical singularity has no height. It has no depth. It has no width. It has no length. And yet Hawking says all the information for everything is in that mathematical singularity. Now, in the Abrahamic religions, they talk about um, uh, in the beginning was the word. Well, the word might be information. I don't, I don't know. But certainly one of the things, and it's, it's one of those thresholds that we, that we process through. You think about mathematics, you think about high energy physics, and you can't help but ponder the very question you've asked me. One of the great um, Indian mathematicians, uh, guy by the name of Ramanujan, uh, and, and he'd come up with all these theorems and, and his fellow mathematicians at Cambridge would say, how, how are you getting this stuff? And he would say, I think it was the God Vishnu, but I'm not sure. But uh, one, of, one of his gods from his religion would appear to him. He would tell us in his dreams and would tell him of a theorem. And then he would go and he would tell these famous Cambridge mathematicians of the, of the theorem and they'd work on it and try to look for a proof for it. And, Lo and behold, they find a proof for it. So how is he coming up with these provable theorems? And he's saying, dreams. But that can't be. That's not the way it works. And Ramanujan said, it works for me. So how to answer the question that you just asked me? I don't know. That's one of the nifty things about walking through the next threshold and learning more. We get to celebrate what we don't know. Um, one of the most profound things that I ever heard a politician say, and so I don't get into politics, I'm not even going to tell you who it was, but the sentence was, we don't even know what we don't know. That, that's incredibly profound. And um, in schools, that's kind of the goal for education of every type and at every level Let's bring the kid up through another threshold. Let's bring the graduate student up through another threshold. Let's bring that medical student up through another threshold. And that means they're going to be asking a lot of really good questions about what's on the other side of that threshold. That's education. I've dubbed it sometimes as the great conversation of humankind. That's education as opposed to just training or preparing people for the next standardized test. Wow, well, thank you so much for walking us, or walking me and, and, and people uh, through the threshold, because uh, absolutely just, just mind-boggling how you, you know, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. So really appreciate your time. Uh, folks, if you're watching us, uh, this is one of many videos that we've posted uh, on YouTube. Uh, search for Dr. Paul Wagner to find this and, and so many more insights uh, around uh, his books. And Dr. Wagner, once again, thank you so much for, for allowing us to capture this, this wisdom <laughs> then, and, and use it for, for what we don't know. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. For your time. Thank you so much. For, till next time. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.